who have not kneeled the knee to the idols, have not kissed the mouth of Baal. There are 7,000 who have the spirit of Messiah in them. And in the context of unfolding events, God will call them to their feet. They're everywhere. They're all over the earth. And this, this fellowship of the mystery helped God turn the wheel of Dharma, the wheel of Genesis. And, and that's why we should, we should get access to these books, the Dead Sea Scriptures, which talks about, in one of these texts, the two spirits in man that God created in the Garden of Eden when the law came. And these two spirits, the spirit of light and the spirit of darkness, have been dwelling together in the heart of all of us. But now you see the division is taking place. The light is moving to the light, the darkness is moving to the darkness. And well, we all have to move the Exactly. That's why, that's why the scripture says, Lord, didn't you sow good seed in the field? And the master said yes, and he said, well, how come all this unrighteousness is growing up with the righteousness in the context of your teaching? Should we root it out? And the master said, oh, no, 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 no. Because if you root out the evil, you will also root out the good, because everyone has good and evil dwelling in them and working itself out one way or another. So you let the two grow together to the harvest. That's when God will send the angels and they will sort the light from the darkness. Absolutely. Every spark of life, whether it is now sojourning in the darkness or sojourning in the light, is going to be brought into the eternal realms. When this the light goes out on this dying ember of a world. The very last person alive will collect whatever little sparks of life are left, shut the door, put out the light, and everything that ever has the spark of life in it will be in eternity. Even the Antichrists will all be up there. Everything will be up there because it's all God. God's not going to leave any part of him and herself. And now science, though, is giving us right. an insight to these things in equations and in theories. And it's, we just, Compelling. as we learn, we're living in a magic hologram. We're living in a magic world that, as the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, said that God has created out of the effulgence of their own presence, their own mind. You know, uh, it's the same way uh, Newton, when he discovered the, uh, the principles of gravitation, and from Newton's theories, we began to understand that if you know enough about the properties of nature, you can count backwards in time or forwards in time. And if you can follow the laws that are governing the, the principles of nature, you know exactly where that planet's going to be 10 years from now, or where that conjunction is going to happen 100 years from now, as long as you know the size of the arc and the dimensions of the circle and the properties that govern, the laws that govern that uh, reality. So it's the same way in the great circle of history. If we know something about the laws that are governing the unfolding reality of this circle of events, we can, as the prophets did in the past, look into the future and see where it will culminate. You see, they know the laws that are governing this circle. So they said, at a certain, certain time, when you observe the high holy days, this will happen. And we see it happening. So now we, from that perspective of being able to perceive the present, we can now use the same laws and count backwards in time and see where it all happened. So when we begin to see that this circle all of a sudden comes crashing in on itself 120 jubilees ago, we now can begin to construct, um, again, a picture of these epochs. So we say that there has been 40 jubilees from our time to the time of Christ. There were 40 jubilees from the time of Christ 
backwards to the time of Abraham, the Vedic age. And then there were 40 Jubilees, or 1,960 years, from the time of the Vedas, time of Abraham, back to the Garden of Eden. And this number 120 we see constantly revealing itself in the in uh, the text of the Hebrew Scriptures about Moses being 120 years old, because you see the Torah came to Adam. And so now we see this 120, we see 120 in the story of, uh, of um, Noah, we see this number in many, many places. So then all of a sudden as we read the Torah and we read the Leviticus where from. We are commanded to, after we enter into this mystery, at the time of Passover, begin the counting. Count the Oma, count the 49s. So as soon as we know that we're supposed to count segments of time in 49s, then we can count from then to here. How do you know what you mean in 49? We're told. In the book of Levit Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, it says from Passover begin to count um, a period of seven times seven, whether it's days or years, you begin to count 49s. And so there's a whole book dedicated to this count called the Book of Jubilees, the Book of the Divisions of Time, that is older than the New Testament and that the New Testament writers had in their, in their hands. In it, it says that Moses, when he was carried up to the, the state of um, divine consciousness, was shown all the divisions of the times from the past to the future. And so Moses, of course, seeing those things, then says, okay, we're going to divide reality into segments of sevens. Seven is the number in which God will reveal the mystery of time. Why seven? Well, uh, it, has to do with the zodiac and the seven it has to do with the zodiac, but it has to do with the fact that if you take seven circles and Put them together, you see that they all fit tangentially. How do, how does tangentially. This, tangentially, in a perfect circle. One circle in the middle, six circles, all touching each other and all touching the surface of the center circle. Mm -hmm. So, you see that these um, these uh, geometric diagrams are manifestations of God's divine consciousness because God is the scripture says that by number and weight has the God created the universe and that's what Kabbalah is it's the study of numbers and uh, so uh, when we study numbers and geometrical patterns mm -hmm. we are looking literally into God's thoughts mm -hmm. and we see the patterns that God used to construct their creative order. It's taken all of this time, all of these jubilees, for science and mathematics to mature to the point where they can reconcile to mystical concepts. Exactly. But the mind of darkness could never, they would never see these subtle they would never. Well, they may see them, but they'll never interpret them. They will interpret them in the interest of their own well being. Well, because that inspiration is coming from the divine. The inspiration is coming from the Christ, mind of Christ within that has the ability to perceive and interpret. Exactly. It's already on a hard drive. What we just have to do is bring out the, um, the wired for it. And that happened in the transformation that we began to experience from our own dark nature to our to what, what happened was the, the, uh, the, the electrons, the electromagnetic impulses that govern our thought began to move in other patterns, began to move in, in patterns in our consciousness that align with the pattern of the, uh, the mind of God. Yeah, the, the whole symbol of the ark is a symbol of the vessel of human history. And uh, they used uh, natural metaphors to explain uh, great epic spiritual uh, realities and so uh, they um, in this one of the books of the Apocrypha it says that that these that these mysteries were taken into 
a vessel of very small value and they were carried across the sea. You see, because the adepts in the sciences, the emerging hidden sciences realized, oh, the structure of our thoughts are not confined to here. This is not, that we're talking about, uh, this is the mystery of the whole world. And so what they then began to do is travel into the earth, looking for wisdom, finding wisdom from those people all over the earth who already were in, in some rudimentary way, already repositories of this wisdom. This is the time of that. Yes. Right? And there's an exchange occurring. Yes. And that's why we find these ideas all over the earth. Okay. We find okay. everywhere we go, we find the structure of these same exactly. basic principles. The Egyptians began to build pyramids. Mm -hmm. Whether they were conscious of it or not. Right. And In, the minds began to build pyramids. Exactly. Whether they were conscious of it or not. Yeah. This mystery of the tree of life was taken from here to there and carried all across the known world at that time. Uh, but when they got there, when these mystics got there, they didn't just go as imperious teachers going in and they're going to teach wisdom to, you know, the, the fallen masses of humanity. They went there looking for the wisdom that would corroborate what they were already knowing. Because it's in archetypal images and forms that God has spoken to all humanity. So when these teachers, these adepts of this hidden Adamic science went into Asia, they found individuals who not only corroborated their revelation, but were able to add something to them. The, the, you know, the, the, the concept of the Tao, the flow of time. Uh, and the Hebrew adepts would say, yes, we understand that because we see it in our structure. And then the adepts in Asia would say, well, connect us. And all of a sudden, the Western wisdom would pass into Eastern thought. And in this interchange of reverence and respect between these teachers and students in the world tradition, the world mystery and the structure began to solidify and reveal itself. And these things were taken to Africa and the shamans and great minds that dwelt in Africa that were in touch with the divine. Those who came out of the north came into the African continent. And they came as individuals of peace, bringing Western and European understanding, but Again, looking for wisdom, confirmation that the things that they were understanding was also understood by all others. And they ran into the teachers in the African continent who looked into the symbols, could see the pyramidal shapes, could see the ideas forming, and said, oh yes, we've been singing about this for many, many hundreds of years. Our parents had taught us these things. And, um, and everything began to conform. Is Taoism as old or older than the Taoism? Well, it, it, uh, it, Taoism is an expression of a principle that has always existed in the earth prior to Adam. It, Adam just becomes the mind that is capable of understanding the principle. The principle of of time, the principle of that which is one breaking into the many, the the principle of being in the flow of divine reality, karmic law unfolding in the history of the planet, and um, being in harmony with these principles and these uh, unfolding realities, and so um, uh, Adam, the mind of Adam simply just assimilated the ideas out of the East, but confirmed them for the mind of the East itself. Said, yes, we, we concur. We, 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 are, we see it in the structure of our own thoughts. It is, it is absolute true. We will now take it back to the West with us, and we will include it in the context of all of our emerging uh, state of concern. When they said we take it back to the West, they meant 
back to the Middle East. Yeah, back to the Central Europe, to back the West to yeah, of Asia. yeah, sure. And then finally, you see that there was a time of forgetfulness where these things uh, uh, slowly began to uh, drift out of the consciousness of the people, but were retained by the religious shamans and teachers all throughout the earth. Uh, because people had to get down to the business of being human. And uh, so these ideas simply then settled down as the guiding principles of the religious traditions of the people, whether they understood them or not. And these ideas then began to take form in rituals, in observances, in symbols. And then, of course, at different times in history, there were revivals and reawakenings of these ideas. And in the time of Solomon, 1,000 years before Christ, you see now that um, these ideas begin to take uh, travel out across the ocean again. And they wind up in Central America again, which will begin the great pyramid of, uh, uh, period of pyramid building in Central America. Because these ideas were already here in archetypal form, but now they will be re Revived and there will be a resurgence. Waves, uh, Waves of uh, revive themselves, rekindle uh, themselves. Uh, exactly. Uh, yes. And it Adam, doesn't die out. Exactly. Because again, the, the religion of Adam is prophetic. It must constantly rekindle itself because it contains within itself fact that God is hiding it from the sons of darkness. What is the pre Adamic religion? Is there one? It's uh, spiritualism, pantheism. Uh, paganism? Uh, well, what we call paganism, what, uh, what um, the church came to call paganism. But Maybe Paul said... Negative connotations, uh, uh, but I just mean earth. Work. Yes, but the, the church began to use that name. But uh, remember, Paul says, I'm indebted to everyone. I mean, I'm indebted to the barbarian. I'm indebted to, with meaning, those who are far off from this mystery. I'm indebted to them. Um, well, because he was learning wisdom from them, that they had pieces of the puzzle that he was now reincorporating into his view of the world. There was no Torah. Well, sure, that's what constituted the law. It was extremely utilitarian. That which enhanced life was good. That which enhanced death was bad. Mm -hmm. And so they had their own statutes and, and, and uh, conventions no that their own primal nature that hadn't been conquered yet or even addressed. Noah represents the eight people on the ark represent, every, you see, we're now moving from the place number seven on the tree of life to the place number eight. When you get to the place number eight, it completes the structure of the tree of life. When you see that the tree of life conforms to the structure of the ark, and you'll see it in the website, you see that we are now coming to that time in history where the door of the ark will be opened at the place number eight. That's why there are eight souls on that ark because the ark is a symbol of the vessel of human history itself that has been riding upon the waves of these wars and conflicts and cataclysms and, and uh, that have uh, inundated human history. And so you, Noah sets, he sends out the, um, the raven, which symbolizes the spirit of darkness. And so the raven is all over the earth today. So the door of the ark will not be opened until Noah sets out the dove and the dove doesn't return because it means now there's peace in the earth. The dove found a place to set her feet. The wars are over. There's quiet in the earth. And now the ark opens up and all the creatures that are on the ark, which represent all the various levels of human consciousness and all the people that are in the world now come out of the ark. The earth is quiet. And now we can set up an altar to the creator.
the universe and peace will come to the earth. The Vedic religions or the Western religions? And then well, they're coming to fulfillment in the West. There is Adamic state of mind is coming to perfection all through the earth. Everywhere in the earth, there are people coming to the perfection in the light of these realities. The rulers of Peking do not have the Torah, and they don't guide themselves by that law. The rulers of the Soviet Union do not pretend to be Christian men, uh, because it's not their nature. It's not their. It's it's not the state of mind that God has embedded in their consciousness. What has God embedded in their consciousness? An angelic nature, an angelic mind, warrior mind. They they be ready to be called to their feet to defend uh, God's interest in the world. That's why it says that the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, which means out of the realm of higher human consciousness. Book of John says, and you shall, see, you shall see the heavens opened, which means your mind will open, and you will see the angels of God descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. But the word at the age of Adam was born, and the Torah comes into being, what's first, the Torah or the Vedas? Uh, well, when I mean the Torah, I mean the universal law, which will take form in Vedic uh, understanding and, of course, in the Torah of Moses. It's not like Moses studied Veda. Veda. Sure. The Torah comes essentially of The Veda. written Torah comes later, a thousand years after the Veda. But when I use the term Torah in its universal form, I mean the universal law itself, which can be interchanged with Veda or Torah. Nation is found in, in, in the in the violation Christ. of the teachings of Christ. In the violation of the teachings of Christ. Exactly. And that's the subtle nature of the beast because it's been able to convince us that America is the uh, modern manifestation of the law and the prophets. You can then manipulate the minds of the weaker individuals to consume more goods. And I mean, like two days after the World Trade Center bombing, there was this bomb, no waste destruction, and there was a commercial for Tide. You know, they will use almost anything. There's no, there's no, the, no moral no, base. No, no moral fiber. They will draw the line. Yeah. No, well, that's what it is. It's moral. You see, they have their own criteria for what is moral and what is immoral. But they're the ones who have set the rules. And when you read the rules and the conventions, you see that they are in direct violation of the, uh, the rules and conventions established for us in the law and the prophets. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Just uh, the Lord lift up his countenance upon everyone and grant us all peace. See these things happening, see them emerging. So if we were able if we if we would look back over the course of the last twenty years, we would see how God has been moving all of the pieces, all the chess pieces have been being moved in places, all of the alliances have been being made, all of the tensions that were necessary to bring about these events have been uh, being excited in the consciousness of the planet. When Ronald Reagan came and America boasts so thoroughly of the role he had in diminishing and in the, in the collapse of the Soviet Union, what we should have seen, of course, is that now all of the conditions that would lead for the to the Third World War were allowed to um, unfold. The Soviet Union with its vast military power reach into all of the, the various places of the earth was keeping all of these events in check. And now with the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of a sudden all of the events that are leading to these conflicts were allowed to flame up and there was nothing to stop them. So in essence, uh, just as the scripture says, thou shalt not kindle 
any fire or any flame on the Sabbath day, well, Orthodox Jewish people, of course, refrain from striking a match on uh, their Sabbath day as they observe it. But uh, the um, true meaning, the fullest meaning of that scripture is that you shall not kindle God's wrath on the day of the Lord. And that's what um, the American nations are doing and have been doing. They are kindling the fire of God's wrath because the scripture does say not only is God a consuming fire, but God is a God of war. Yes, that is his name. And that's why God, in their infinite wisdom, as father and mother, brought the age we are living in right now, 2,000 years ago, when the light of Christ came into the world. This was God's way of saying to us, now look, 40 jubilees from now, I have determined to end this age and to begin another age. You will see it unfolding. You will see it happening. But when you do, this is the way I command you to walk. I command you to walk in peace and in holiness with all men, without which no one will be able to see me rising up in the sun of all human events. Because if your mind is still engrossed in the throes of darkness, you will not see me, the God of war, rising up in the earth in all of these terrible events that I, the Lord, will bring to pass. <clears throat> and so only the mind of light can see that. And that's basically why we are standing in Union Square and in the street corners of this city is to... Um, bring the light of this understanding to the people so that they can, um, you know, to dissolve the illusions, to break the spell of darkness that we are living in. Uh, as the book of Thessalonians says, uh, that God has cast upon us a fierce delusion because we have believed a lie. And the lie is, particularly here in the western ends of the earth, exists in the belief that to be a true Christian is to be a true American. And these two spirits are now in dire conflict, one with another, the light against the darkness, the lie against the truth. And um, this conflict, of course, will result in the severe repressions that the children of light will soon begin to experience this country. Can you elaborate on how 50 years ago or 200 years ago this couldn't have occurred? No pun intended, but in light of the fact that the, the tool of coming to perfection for the children of light is in fact the intensity of that darkness. The prophet Daniel says, of course, speaking of these days, he said that um, that everyone will go to and fro and knowledge will increase. Well, in order for this day to have come into existence and in order for, for the human mind to have attained to the state of consciousness that is appropriate to understanding the meaning and the mystery of God's presence in the sum of all reality. In order for God to have brought us to this state of human consciousness where we can finally and at last look into the transcendent dimensions of reality, literally look in to the fourth dimension, the, the, the dimension of the time-space continuum, and through it into the very present reality of parallel universes, heavens, nirvana, um, that a process of evolution had to unfold. 
And uh, the tree of life, of course, is the oracle through which and by which we um, understand the process of this uh, state of human evolution. And so just as the tree is a very organic thing, and just as the tree brings life and light uh, to the whole planet, so the tree of life is also an organic state of divine revelation revelation it is growing it is it is moving in every every living way and as it grows and as as it has been growing and as the universe has been expanding as we are now discovering in the 20th century so human consciousness has been expanding with it to the point where now we can put all of the little pieces and put them together. We can see how um, this particular science has been perfecting itself over here and this particular values and ideas and concepts have been uh, uh, creating themselves over here. Now, you know, you have the religion over here, you have science over here, and then you have all the other disciplines of um, human life all around. But what we're seeing now is we're attaining to a holistic understanding of the meaning of reality, the meaning of life. So what people have been doing now is taking this set of ideas and this set of ideas and this set of ideas, and we're beginning to see how they interlock and how they create an image of the whole. Well, this took necessarily uh, a process of human evolution and the foundation for these ideas, the foundation for our abilities to even begin such a process are the result of the tiny little steps into the scientific state of understanding. You see, uh, thousands of years ago, the Divine Lord was able to intuitively intrude and uh, intertwine himself with the ancient shaman state of mind, with the prophets, with the seers. And so God, it was, um, um, it, it, what we're, do, we're talking about is two ends of the divine spectrum. You see in the middle you have this uh, visible, the, the visible spectrum where all things that are apparent to the eyes appear. Well, if you take that as a metaphor, you see Everything that we see has an invisible dimension preceding it and a division of invisible dimension proceeding from it. So if you just take history, the apparent unfolding of history, as all compressed into the visible spectrum of light, things we understand, things we can see. Well, before that is this time in which the Lord of Heavens interacted with the minds of the prophets. There was this invisible interaction going on between shamans, prophets, seers, all throughout the earth, all throughout the earth and every continent, God was speaking to um, those who were able to um, perceive the voice of the invisible God. And um, thousands of years transpired as these mystics began to compare their notes, traveling all over the world at that time. And there was a general agreement, and we'll see it as we study back into those times. You know, when you look at the structure of all the, the, the symbols and the structure, the archetypal uh, ideas that were present and guiding every people all throughout the earth, you see that not only was God revealing the very same things to each of these peoples, but you begin to study that there was communication between the adepts in all of these various parts of the world, one with another. So now a, 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 uh, a prophetic tradition was established. All right, so this is just the one end of the spectrum. Now the prophets prophesied in terms of principles, in terms of ideas, they spoke of things and realities that um, that were not um, 
we, that we could only accept by faith. It was the instrument of belief that uh, brought us into communion with these prophets and their sayings. But now we are passing from belief to a state of sight. We are now in this moment. We are seeing with our eyes the unfolding of all those things that the prophets spoke about. But now as we proceed, you know, as this moment of sight moves along like uh, the quantum rhythm of reality itself, now we've come to the other end of history where we are able through the sciences of relativity and quantum physics through the work of Copernicus and Newton and Kepler and finally on right into the time of Einstein and the quantum physicists our time, we are now able to look into this invisible dimension, this transcendent fourth dimension, ten dimension, dimensional reality, but we're doing it through the means of science, through the means of mathematics. In other words, what God is doing is how what God revealed in the beginning of time, he is now and they are now confirming to be true without access to mathematical equations and theorems and graphs and charts. They spoke of things that we are now finding to be absolute reality. And so what God is doing now is closing uh, uh, completing the spectrum so that from the invisible to the realm of sight we are now moving into the invisible dimension again and we are now moving to a state of higher human consciousness into a understanding that this world leads through the quantum field into the very present reality of worlds above parallel universes and so, in essence, it has everything to do with the, uh, what unfolded the other day, because as we've been told by the Vedas and by the teachings of the ancients for thousands of years, that death is really an illusion. Death is really an illusion. And so if we're, meant to, we're lamenting the death of our loved ones, it's because we have not had any faith in the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the prophets, the teachings of the ancient seers, because they have told us that once a person is walking in the light of God consciousness, even though they appear to die, they do not really, because what they do is just, they just move from one state of reality to another state. Not only is the world moving towards a state of transcendent understanding of invisible realities, but when the principles of science began to unveil themselves when the laws of nature began to be able to, when the laws of nature began to excite in man a need to discover the underlying basic foundations of those laws. We look back through European history and we see all of a sudden these societies of esoteric students of Kabbalah, students of underlying realities, students of the mysteries, and out of them emerged the society of alchemists. These alchemists uh, had to conceal their studies because they were now moving into uh, the hidden dimensions of reality and they were taking precepts and turning them into sort of scientific realities. They were searching for the power to transmute one element to another. And they were using esoteric precepts from the scriptures. They were looking for this, um, in Job it says there is a place where gold is refined and, and um, where gold is created in reality out of the coarse matter of life itself. And so the original alchemists, some driven by um, the fact that they understood that these were um, spiritual concepts. Others were saying, yes, but a spiritual concept may have its effects in the material realm. So maybe we can use the spiritual concepts to actually transmute and find the ways to, to kind of sort of enter into the process of creation ourselves. And so 
they were looking for all these magic formulas and of course uh, the um, the uh, the central um, object of their search was for the philosopher's stone and this philosopher's stone may be an abstract concept or it may be some actual material thing that if they could just use some of the uh, dustings off of this magic stone wherever it would find they would find the necessary chemical elixir to literally transmute transmute um, basement matter into precious metals and as a result of their failings which caused many individuals to say no what we've been doing is fooling around in a science that has no application in the material realm but these mysteries that we have pursuing really have to do with the transmutation of the base nature of man into the gold and the precious metals of divine consciousness. And so many of the alchemists left off with their tinkering in science and uh, began to uh, merge themselves into secret esoteric religious societies. Well, but what happened in that process is that the very science of physics was born not that it the principles of physics did not proceed from pythagorean times and all those things but now as time was now speeding up and things were intensifying the very mysteries that were necessary for the eventual creation of uh, the atomic bomb the foundation of those uh, understandings were uh, we, we lay at the doorsteps of the alchemists in the Middle Ages. And so now we see what God did. Through the study of scriptures, God set two processes in motion. The process that would lead to the actual transformation of human consciousness and the one that would lead to the very terrible conditions that we see ourselves in, and that is with the powers of destruction in the hands of humankind and so what we have here now is through the mysteries of creation you see when they tap into the mystery of creation itself and they broke what god said should not be broken up only through the hardness of our heart have we broken that which god has put together and um and now we have in the world the means to uh, now god has in the world the means to cleanse the earth of all this transgression and to deliver out of the earth or out of this age, which is about to be cleansed by fire one way or another, either the fire of divine love and understanding and wisdom or the fire of physical destruction of this age. But in any event, God is getting ready now to create a new age, which has an understanding of these powers and these forces but it took all of these centuries for these ideas to come to their perfection so that God could reach out of the Eastern world where all his armies are stationed and bring that judgment technologically across the ocean to the Western world where both the evil and the good are coming to perfection. So, well, you know, in the Psalms, in, in the in the the first Psalms as we get see we, right now we can open up all the books of the scriptures because they will all testify to this moment in time. That's what is happening in the world that all things are coming towards this moment of um, um, there's a there's a, a climax of events that are all merging towards this one point in time and space. And all the books of the prophets, all the inclinations, all of the aspirations, all of our thoughts that God has, as God has invested throughout the past and all throughout human history, are all merging at this one point. And it seems from ground level that there's a great conspiracy against good being engineered and manipulated by this Kabul of rich industrialist militarists uh, world statesmen capitalists globalists um, of whom the american system of things seems to be at the forefront it seems that they are conspiring trilateral commission and all these other groups whom we begin to identify 
and we say, wow, they're meeting in secret places and uh, they are trying to um, uh, figure out ways how to maintain not only their control, but their manipulation of the events of history so that they can assure uh, that their aspirations are realized in the world and that they can create the world in their own image. But the scripture says, that he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Because there is only one conspirator in the universe. And that conspirator is the master of the universe himself. And when God put the forces of darkness in motion in ancient times, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. And just as Paul says, now when they begin to say peace and safety, when they believe, that they have a mandate to create the world in their own image, then the sudden destruction will come. And then Paul, of course, goes on to say, but ye are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. For you are the children of the light, you are not the children of the night. Well, what God is doing, of course, has allowed this darkness to flourish and has allowed it to come to such perfection so that the light of darkness is so attractive. Lucifer, the light bearer, he, it's, it, it, the dark side of reality is very attractive. It's very alluring. And we are drawn to it, just as moths are drawn to the fire at night to be, uh, to be um, destroyed. However, God has appointed a time in which to shed a greater light on that light. And that's the process that is unfolding right now in our time. Not only is darkness subtle, that's what the book of Genesis said, that Satan is more subtle than any beast of the field. And of course, Satan is not a character who's running around the earth. Gandhi was right. He said the only devils that are running around on the earth are those that are running around inside of our own thoughts, and this is where our only wars are allowed to be fought against the devils within myself. And if you have not cleansed your heart of the devils that dwell around there, yourself, well then of course naturally you project your delusions out into the world, and instead of seeing God in the sum of all realities, because you have not cleansed yourself of evil, then all you can see is evil out there. And that's what the American and, and its American and its allies uh, they are caught in a spell seemingly of their own making because God is now rising up in the sum of all realities and inviting them to come out to meet him in battle and war. And that's the difference between his, uh, the warriors of Islam uh, is that um, if you look into the Quran, just as you look into every holy book, you will find in there, if God does not open up the mind to see otherwise the rationale for making war against the infidel. And so, um, freely or otherwise, the Quran says, all the denizens of the earth are serving Allah. So if God has kept the mind of these warriors of God in the East, the, these Islamic warriors of God, in darkness, it is simply to illuminate in the West, the darkness of that mind that dwells here to call both of them up to meet each other, which is literally to meet him in battle. And this is what we are witnessing unfolding here because God set darkness in motion. God has appointed a day. That's why we were commanded to count Jubilees after Passover, which is a, a sign, a command from God that when we observe the ordinances that God commanded us to observe, Passover being one, we will begin the process of transformation. We will leave the Egypt of our own uh, personal existence, and we begin then our passage through the wilderness of the nations until finally we come to the high holy days when we blow the trumpet in the new moon. But those high holy days, metaphorically, happen in the West, because just as Passover begins in the spring of the year, which is 
symbolic of those events that unfolded in the East 40 Jubilees ago or 2,000 years ago. We have now taken the passage of the sun that it is setting in the western ends of the earth. We've come to the sign of the balances. We see the world is completely out of balance. But the, the, these are the works of God so that we could see what imbalance looks like. The rich are ruling over the poor, the powerful over the weak. And of course, for 2,000 years, males have been ruling over the feminine principle. That's why Paul, 2,000 years ago, says, Now the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The, e the wicked era, according to the Dead Sea Scriptures, is now beginning. And so in the course of this great epic mystery that would unfold here in the West, come to its perfect conclusion here in the West, both good and evil have been coming to their mutual states of perfection. And that's why the scripture says that the day of the Lord will not come until the antichrists are revealed. And these antichrists are being revealed in, in, in the collective presence of the rulers of the Western world. Paul had an insight into the mind of the universe itself. He was very much connected to the mind of the Divine Mother, Sophia. Paul knew that the word woman and the word female do not have the same meaning. Paul knew that this difference in interpretation was created by the Divine Mother, Wisdom herself. Paul understood that when the sun rose upon the earth 2,000 years ago and the mystery of iniquity came into, you know, was beginning to come to its fulfillment when the male principle came to power, that the Divine Mother herself was now going into occultation. She was hiding herself in all of the symbols of the waning moon. That's why one of the prophets appear at the time of the birth of Christ and it says, this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel. Well, it means that this child is set for the fall of the feminine principle, but the rising again of the feminine principle at the end of the age. Judaism has been the carrier of this mystery. Judaism following the course of the lunar mystery. So it's from Judaism in the Western world, in our days, will come the anointed ones, will come, this is the feminine side of the tree of life, and it's from the feminine side of the tree of life is coming this balance. But Divine Mother, Sophia, Wisdom, who is clothed in the garments of her own creation, had to withdraw herself, had to hide herself in the garments of her own creation in order for us to see what imbalance looks like, in order for us to see how wickedness will come to its fruition. And that's why she has, and he, of course, in consort one with another, because God is father, God is mother. And so now we see the father, the sign of the ram on the equinox of the mysteries of the 12 signs of the zodiac, the sign of the ram is a symbol of the divine father who has reserved for himself all of those powers of the east to bring them against the western world at the time that the divine mother is here in the west shekinah she is the divine feminine principle of god she is now bringing forth a child that child is being born in the hearts and the minds and and uh, well uh, uh, souls all over the earth but it's intensifying here in america where we're where we are um, observing the high holy days and the blowing of the trumpet in the new moon so so it, it, it was all a mystery um set in motion by the by the feminine principle herself paul knows this that's why he commands the woman to be silent knowing full well that those whom the Divine Mother, who is the Holy Spirit herself inspires, will understand that Paul is not saying, I command the female to be silent. I command the woman to be silent. And what is the mystery? Well, Paul says, look, when I speak of Adam and Eve, I mean Christ and the church. 
Christ is that spirit that dwells in every person, whether they are male or female, who knows that in the spiritual order of things, they are the, the perfect man. And the woman, Paul said, is the church. And the church is ruled by rabbis, imams, pastors, every, you know, all uh, Rome, who does not allow women to enter into ordination. All of these religious traditions that keep females out of the pulpit because they are interpreting the scriptures according to their lower meaning rather than their higher meaning. But we had to be brought to these understandings so that Paul said there has to be heresies among us so that those who are uh, chosen may be manifest. So this is God's way of now dividing the children of light, the children of true wisdom, which are made up of all males and females, of all religious traditions, of every race of humankind who have transcended the lower interpretations of reality. And we see that uh, not only is a female equal to any male in the spirit of Christ, and she may teach at any time she wishes because she's the man in the spiritual order of things, but from the Jewish or lunar side of the tree of life is coming the anointed ones, and it's not a male person, but to sit, sitting on the throne of David will be a female and a male joined together in perfect harmony, in perfect balance, and through the light of their relationship and throughout all times, whoever is sitting on the throne of David, no matter what race or what ancient religious tradition they have come through, will always reflect the balance that God created in the universe, balance that was broken throughout the course of the age of wickedness and which is now being restored. Well, um, first of all, you mentioned uh, the, um, the destruction of the towers last week. Well, um, of course, this was foretold um, 2,700 years ago by the prophet Isaiah, uh, and that these things would unfold in conjunction with our observance of the high holy days and the return of the feminine principle, the return of balance to the earth. So in order for the new to be born, the new state of consciousness to be born, the old must come to its conclusion. And that's why Isaiah, 30th chapter, says that in that day there shall be rivers and streams of waters against all the great mountains. The great mountains means great empires, great nations. In the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall. Well, these towers, of course, are symbolic of... Uh, the mystery of Babylon itself. This is a very ancient mystery. The, uh, the city of Cain, the city of the sons of darkness that uh, God, uh, you know, when we built the towers in Babylon in ancient times, God destroyed them. And now we're surprised to see that God has thrown them down again. But Isaiah says, in the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall, well, this is the beginning of these judgments that will now and fall upon the entire institutions of the Western world. The economy is already collapsing. The world is going to war. The prophet Joel says, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war meet him. Draw near. Let them come up into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Well, that's what God is doing. The valley of Jehoshaphat, is not necessarily a place as much as it is an unfolding event that will take place all the way from Afghanistan and culminate in the judgments upon America itself. The Valley of Jehoshaphat is that place where when the children of Israel were going out to battle against the Syrians, which in reality is just a battle that we must fight against our own lower nature, King Jehoshaphat came out and he said, 
all you children of Israel, get out of the battlefield. Come off this field because you have nothing to do with this battle. This battle is God's. And that's why Joel says then, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Everyone must decide now in our time whether this is God or it is not God. If it is not God, well then your fate is probably to follow man into man's ruin and destruction. We must decide whether we fear God or fear man and um, whether we uh, cast our lots with the world God is trying to create or the one man is trying to create in his own image. So it's uh, a day of great decision. And that day will unfold as all the chess pieces now begin to be moved around because God will ultimately bring this age to an end while protecting all of those things that God wants to protect, that, that God wants preserved into the light of the coming age. So it's hard, of course, to see exactly where God is going to move the next piece. The most essential and important realization is to see that God is moving them. And that we just have to sit back like you do at uh, uh, Washington Square Park. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, you just look over the shoulders of um, those people playing these excellent and fierce and furious games of chess. Just sit back and watch and be awed as the skilled craftsman, who is the God of the universe itself, starts moving the pieces. And as God move, starts moving the pieces, you will see how he will enjoin the nations of the Western world in this conflict. They will be... Um, uh, they will be called beyond even their desire. Even if they do not want to drink this cup, the prophet Jeremiah says, they will drink unless they repent. Unless they will just lay down their arms and help bring about the age of peace, the age of righteousness, then they will enter into the uh, events that will lead to their own destruction. You see China, you see Russia, that's why the prophet Joel says, cast in the sickle, for the harvest of the earth is ripe, for their wickedness is full, the fats overflow. Um, because China and the Soviet Union are those great angelic nations that God has reserved for himself to bring, finally, the sickle, the harvest across the Western world, to harvest out of the West, everyone who says they are walking in the light of Christ but are not. Because if we say we are and we are not, then that means we are antichrist or we're under the spell of the powers of the antichrist. And that's what God is getting ready to harvest out of the earth. Well, very soon the nations will be clamoring for some means of ending these conflicts. Because if the conflicts are allowed to uh, continue, there will be enormous loss of life. There will be enormous rack and ruin. Over there. Over there. Right. Over there. Not quite in America yet, because a different kind of battle will begin to unfold over here. Over here, there will be the conflict between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. The, the, uh, the, the new age will begin mm -hmm. to be born here. Well, over there, the wars of God will pursue. And in the world's stupor and in its natural desire to end, to have a cessation, a cessation to these uh, terrible conflicts, the world will and has been for many years now, will cry out, for um, a peace and a peacemaker. And a peacemaker. Well, James Earl Carter uh, is an individual who the scripture describes as one who has magnified himself 
in his heart, but through peace shall the, deceive many. And uh, James Earl Carter, uh, there's a book just recently written about Jimmy Carter called The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter. It says that he's the only person that has ever used the office of the presidency as a stepping stone to higher office, to higher things. Mm. Uh, Jimmy Carter has, mm. even though he is steeped in the American capitalist Christian ethos, mm. he has transcended the local politics of America itself. He's moving now in international circles. He's moving around at the level of the United Nations, uh, the concerns of the United Nations. He is in many ways a um, spokesman for the religious, uh, the religious spokesman for the uh, new global capitalist order. Even if he has divorced himself and has taken his name off the rolls of some of these clandestine organizations, the trilaterals and everything, because Jimmy Carter is very, very zealous for his image, he nevertheless is um, deeply embedded in uh, the Western world's attempt to extend its uh, philosophy and its power and its influences into the rest of the world. And so he's on the vanguard of this movement. So, of course, um, at the moment, these are just a prophecy that he will return to some position of authority. But in the moment he does, then every one of us should fix our gaze on him and not be deceived by his overtures to peace, by his rhetoric of peace. Uh, Jimmy Carter is a supreme warrior. He, um, he is hard and cold. Jimmy Carter likes serving people to enhance his own sense of himself, but he does not like people. He goes and works a week every now and again in Habitat for humanity, but when he was first asked to lend his support to these things, he, uh, he didn't see any value. Uh, he, in essence, he thought these were just a bunch of um, ragtag hippie crackpots. Uh, but later on, when he seen how it would enhance his reputation and enhance the reputation of the Carter Center for Conflict Resolution, uh, that how he could um, In essence, um, while deceiving himself that he is a, uh, a true man of God, he unconsciously would deceive the rest of the world that he was really a man of the people. Jimmy Carter is, um, when his agenda for peace breaks down, he will resort to war. Well, you see, what everything is going to be revolve around what is going on in America. God is now shaking the foundations of the Western world. And in the process is awakening the consciousness of the children of light in the world. And now there's this great pulling apart, one from the other, the light from the darkness. We are not of the darkness, we are of the light, Paul said. So we see the military conflicts that are now preparing to unfold in the East. Russia and China are standing back and they don't know exactly how they should be involved in these conflicts or how they should withhold themselves in this conflict. It seems that Russia does have an issue with the Taliban, with uh, fundamentalist Islam, but of course Muhammad said, woe to those who, uh, who don't see the true meaning of the Quran and woe to them in the day they see the angels. And uh, that's what the Soviet Union and China are. They are fierce military angelic orders. That, that's why the scripture says, unto you 
who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that obey not God. Well, those angels are not coming out of the heaven. They're coming out of the heaven of human comprehension. They're coming out of the east. They're coming out of Russia. They're coming out of China. So it is my belief, although it could happen otherwise, that Russia and China will enter into the conflict in the most severe way in order to support that which is unfolding in America. Because only in America could the true spiritual revolution unfold. Only in a, Mikhail Gorbachev, when he came to power in the Soviet Union in the 1980s, and in his traveling back and forth between Russia and America, he and his wife, Raisa, who are very astute students of the philosophy of um, communism, understood that the true socialist revolution could not happen anywhere but in America. It could not happen in Russia, which is comprised mostly of a peasant class, God bless their soul. But they had no access to the vast talents and skills that the American people had access to. They had no, not that they didn't have access to religious impulse, desire for communion with God. There is a deep religious sentiment in Russia underlying that uh, that sort of uh, defines the Russian soul. But here in America, God has brought every stream of religious consciousness to bear upon our times here in the West. Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism. And it, it is here that we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Here where we have not only the desire for these things, but we have the talents and skills and the means to communicate these ideas. And so Gorbachev knew that only in America could this happen. And of course, he even made the statements many times that socialism in Russia supports the cause of Christ, even if he unconsciously um, said it and didn't fully, was not fully aware. So it's my contention then, as this new thing begins to be born in America, according to Isaiah 66 and Revelation 12, that there will be severe repressions in America against this emerging light. There will be arrests, there will be executions in a time of crises. It's against the law. We saw it in World War I when it was a crime, I believe at that time, punishable even by death to speak up against the war efforts of America in a time of war. Well, it's the same today. I would um, maybe suggest that if anyone was um, really interested in, um, uh, from an academic point of view, of gaining a, a sort of an insight into the things that are unfolding and into the interpretations that we are espousing in our time, that we might, um, they might gain a good insight if they found a copy of the Dead Sea Scriptures by Theodore H. Gaster. Okay. Among all the insights into the meaning of the Scriptures, I believe Theodore Gaster, in this edition, captures um, the moment in which we are passing in the most uh, um, perfect way. And the other is on the mystical shape of the Godhead, basic concepts in Kabbalah by Gershom Shalom. These books, and also Gershom Shalom on the Kabbalah and its symbolism. Um, the different, give, different stuff in each of those two books? Yeah, bas much, much of the same stuff, but any of the works by Gershom Shalom um, will add an, an, an additional insight into the means by which we have come to the conclusions that we do and the interpretations 
of the mystical tradition as we are. And it's by our attempt, and maybe I shouldn't use the word attempt anymore, by our, uh, and maybe I shouldn't use the word ability either, but by the fact that we are now breaking into the symbolism of the oracle, the tree of life, we are now able to gain and take out of it all of the ideas that have been ensouled and embodied in this symbol in ancient times, from the time of Aaron and Moses, and then to the time of the Essenes and John the Baptist, and then when, of course, along the Jewish side of this tree of life, when that Pharisee of Pharisees, Elisha ben Abuya, who we know as Paul, appeared. And now we are here in our time and are um, beginning to experience and see the unfolding of these realities in our time. So that's maybe one way to cross back into this. When, when did the Kabbalah become part of the Jewish mystical tradition? Well, um, Kabbalah is like a river running into a sea. It has many uh, streams and many uh, substreams that have uh, found their way out of ancient times into the mainstream of, of uh, Hebrew and Jewish consciousness. So um, it depends on um, where in the Kabbalah you are reading uh, do we find um, a place maybe where the foundations of the Kabbalah are set. So some would say they were the foundations are in the time of Abraham, Abraham. But of course, the time of Abraham, the Vedic age, um, uh, proceeds backwards in time. And these uh, uh, systems of uh, mystical insight didn't appear in a vacuum. And so, um, in essence, we can trace the doctrines of the Kabbalah. We can uh, trace the doctrines of the Kabbalah back to the Garden of Eden itself mm -hmm. and back to the initial revelation that uh, God gave to Adam, that first human couple. And the wisdom, the understanding, the, uh, the concept of um, searching into the higher dimensions of reality for truth uh, was then set loose in the earth. And we have now come 6,000 years to where that pursuit of transcendent tr understanding is now resulting in our, under uh, it has resulted in the structure of the tree of life. It has re resulted in all of the ideas that are, have been embodied in that symbol to which we now may gain access. So again, it's been an evolutionary process from the time of Adam to our own time, but those are archetypal times. We have returned to them. Everything that uh, we read in the book of Genesis and in the ancient Vedas uh, that had to do with uh, those earliest of revelations are simply being replicated in our time because we have returned, in essence, to the Garden of Eden and back to the root of the Tree of Life. Was there a man before were, were there human homo sapiens on earth before Adam and Eve? Oh, sure. Uh, the world is populated with humankind for hundreds of thousands of years before God's first revelation to Adam. Adam is the first archetypal spiritual beings. They the first monotheists. They were the first out of uh, all other individuals in the metaphorical sense, but also in the historical sense, to receive a revelation of the unity of God's presence in the sum of all reality. And so the, 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 uh, the tradition of monotheism began at that time. And of course, it was a tradition that still had to be worked out in the context of all unfolding realities. And, and we are now um, uh, find ourselves as the uh, repositories of that tradition. And we see that uh, uh, in the earth, there are still all of these other 
spirits and races of humanity that are not Adamic in essence, but rather are angelic in essence. And that's why Paul said, let no man um, deceive you in the worshiping of angels intruding into things they have never seen. The ancient sons of God lived in the earth before Adam. And uh, these are those forces and powers in the earth that God has reserved to themselves against this day. And these are the forces and the powers that are coming out of the East to uh, facilitate the birth of the coming age. These are angelic in essence, very ancient, older than Adam itself, older than the spirit. I'd like to get back to that later. So Adam and Eve were not truly a single couple, man and woman. It was not a man and a woman. No, it's all metaphor. There was a male and a female, uh, archetypally and metaphorically. The scripture says, let us create man in our image. Well, we are now coming to the point where that is happening. We are now, just now, being created in God's image. And it has been a 6,000 year process from the time of the Garden of Eden until now. And that scripture is now only being fulfilled we have been in this process of creation all of these millennia, all of these centuries. We have now come back to the meaning, and not only the meaning of these words, but the place in ancient time when these words were first spoken. So we are now actually being created in God's image at this time. And in order to be created in that image, God had to reveal the content of their minds to us in order for us to uh, possess a mind capable of communicating with God at the highest uh, conscious level. And so, uh, because all good and evil flows from the mind of the Creator, we had to see evil in all of its divine aspects and, of course, uh, good, just as the process of birth is uh, the process of, um, well, as every child is born out of the darkness of its own mother's womb, good is being born out of the matrix of darkness. Light is being born out of the darkness, good out of evil. And that's the process that was set in motion, and we are now coming to it. So Gen the story of Genesis is still unfolding. The story of Genesis the story is... story of creation is happening now. Yes, exactly. It's unfolding right here in the context of living reality as, as we sit and speak. And, uh, it's, and, and, and it's all metaphor. Uh, when it says, let us make man in our image, uh, we read in Genesis 5 where it says, and male and female made he them and called their name Adam. The female is not Eve, the female is Adam, just as the male is Adam. And just as Adam is the first Christ, so when the second Christ appeared in the earth 2,000 years ago, again, it was in fulfillment of these ancient metaphorical texts. Christ is not a male person. Christ is a male and a female. The perfect man is a male and a female joined together in perfect harmony. And that's why Paul said, until you come to the unity of the faith, unto the knowledge of the Son of God, the Son of God is not a description of a male person. It's a metaphor used to explain the ability that exists in every single person, whether they are male or female, to sow the seed of higher understanding into the heart of another person. And the person who is receiving that instruction, who is receiving the seed, becomes in the metaphorical realm of things, the woman. It doesn't make a difference if that person is a male or a female, it means they are receiving the seed of higher understanding. And that's why Paul says, now when I speak of these things, this is a great mystery, but I mean Christ and the church. 
Christ is the one who sows the seed. It makes no difference if that person is a male or a female. Eve, the woman, is the one who is receiving the seed. And that's why Paul says, I command the woman to be silent. He doesn't say the female. He means the woman, the church, who doesn't understand that the word woman and female does not mean the same thing. And he says that the woman must be silent and she will be saved in childbirth. Well, everybody stumbles over this meaning. What it means is that when we come to the end of the age, the religious institutions of our time, which is the church, shall bring forth sons and daughters who are capable of understanding these higher realities. And when these sons and daughters appear in the earth, and that's what the scripture says, for the entire earth is waiting for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. When they appear, then the church will be saved. But in the meantime, Paul commands them, if they don't understand these things, to be silent. So it's, it's, it's metaphor, it's allegory, and it, of course, is the esoteric meaning of those things that are unfolding in our time that was hidden from the mind of darkness, but always revealed to the mind of light at, throughout all generations. That's why throughout all generations, those adepts in the spiritual sciences always saw themselves in uh, equal measure with their female, with their wives, with the, with the women in there, with the females in their group. That's why the ancient Druids always had feminine, feminine priests and, and all true esoteric societies have um, recognized the divine in the feminine and male principle together. So before Adam, was there darkness in the world? There was that kind of darkness that God, uh, and uh, it was the kind of darkness that um, uh, prevailed over the earth in the sense that God was not revealing him and herself to the mind of that ancient order. They had other means of, of, of defining their relationship to the mysteries of the cosmos, but it was not in terms of the unity of God's presence. So in that sense, yes, there was a darkness. That darkness still prevails. That darkness prevails over the mind of China. It prevails over the mind of the warriors all over the earth. Uh, but the scripture also says that this is the darkness in which God hides. So this is where God dwells. God dwells in the sun of all of those human realities. And so he hides in the darkness. But when God revealed the first Torah, the first, when the, when the first measure of divine revelation came to Adam, then a new form of darkness appeared in the earth. You see, Paul says, where there is no law, there is no sin. So until the law came to the earth, man was incapable of transgression. There was absolutely incapable of violating the laws of God because the law had not come yet. And so only in this circle of the mystery of Adam can there exist transgression from the commandments of God because the commandments came at the time of Adam. Only Adam could transgress. But just like when an animal kills another animal, there's no... It's the natural order. Right, it's the natural order. No transgression. It is absolutely, uh, uh, it's, it's the natural inclination. They're just following the inclination that God has embedded in the soul of that creature. Just as all of these other non-Adamic nations are just following the inclinations, the primal inclinations that exist in the, in, in, in the soul that, and, and in the mind that um, drives them. So the story of Genesis is a metaphor for the point in human history at which mankind began to recognize the oneness the meaning. from a single source. Yes, that good and evil were now deriving from the same source. And when Adam went out to spread that revelation to those around them, those around them became their church. So Adam, metaphorically or in reality, this first primal archetype, not primal, but first archetypal spiritual couple, 
went into their generation and said to the tribes and peoples around them, look, we just came to an understanding. We just came to a, 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 an insight into reality. We don't have to be afraid of anything because actually everything is God. We don't have to protect ourselves from anything. You know that tribe that lives on the other side of the lake and they're always, uh, they, we always feel threatened by them and that uh, sometimes they even come around and, and pillage us and, and do all of these things and we're trying to figure out how to protect ourselves from them and we're making spears and we're arming ourselves and we're building fortifications to protect ourselves from them. We don't have to. That is God over there. And all we have to do is experience this transformation of consciousness. And if we do, if we all of a sudden begin to work this change in ourself that brings us to a state of what will later, thousands of years later, be called Christ consciousness or Buddha consciousness, if we can attain to that, then the God who dwells in them and the people are saying, what? Are you saying God dwells in them, people? They are fierce. They're, they're, they're warriors. And Adam says, exactly. That's the nature of God. God is a God of war. He's a consuming fire. But we just, we, we just found out from this connection we just made with the divine that if we go over there, not trying to protect ourselves or puffing and, you know, shaking our spears, but if we go over as servants, if we go over as friends, disarmed, that the God who dwells in them will know who we are. And that they will lay down their arms and they won't be threatening us anymore. And, we, and, and if, we don't, uh, if we stop trying to protect these meager little possessions we have, we don't have to worry about anyone stealing them. As a matter of fact, we can give them away. Because the earth is literally full of enough for everybody. And so it's in this magic way that we now understand that we can transform the world and conquer our enemies. But Adam, of course, said, but you must realize first that the enemy is ourself. It's our own fears, our own uh, uh, inclinations to our lower nature. It's our own doubts. And so the people started listening to this. And of course, the people became their first church. But then it says that the church brought forth two sons. So out of this first realization came two spirits, those who were like Cain and those who were like Abel. Those who were like Abel were those who could assimilate that message. And they were the ones who became, in essence, the first pacifists in the earth. They were the ones who said, yes, I, we understand this. We understand this. And therefore, we renounce uh, war from this point. I renounce even the, uh, the, um, the necessity of protecting myself. And so those who now came into the earth in the spirit of Abel became the first of those who would appear later in the time of Christ, who gave rise to Christianity, who are appearing now among the millions and millions in our time who are literally refusing to have anything to do with war throughout the earth. But Cain, the, those who followed the spirit of Cain in those times, were those of whom it is written, in the process of time it came to pass, that Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. Well, in one sense of that scripture, what it means is every one of us have the tendencies towards the light and darkness dwelling in ourselves. And the scripture tells us that in the process of time, after this revelation, because man is very inclined towards his own lower nature, the lower nature rose up in humanity at time and slew the higher consciousness and all of a sudden that which was a light that shone in the world in the time of Adam all of a sudden was diminished as the sons of darkness now began to rule again in the earth 
So the lower consciousness was con conquering the higher consciousness. And that's why the Hebrew religion is a religion, a prophetic religion, because God constantly must send prophets in to ignite the original spark, the original fire because the darkness is very great, but this is all part of the process of creation because God had to allow us not only to see the darkness, but we had to experience it in ourselves in order for us to come to a full and uh, conscious state of God realization. So the last 6,000 years is the history of not only darkness the spirit of Cain coming to its absolute perfection. And remember, God put a mark on Cain when he killed his brother Abel. That mark shows up in the book of the Revelation as the mark of the beast. Anyone who uh, yields to his own beastly nature, even if he does it in the name of God, is marked. Because he is, that is the spirit of anyone who finds justification for killing another human being in the context of these teachings that began with Adam and that are coming to perfection in the mystery of Christ. So that's why it says the day of the Lord will not come until the Antichrists are revealed. The Antichrists have now become the most powerful individuals in the face of the earth. They are all marked, and they are marked with this mark of the beast, which they are now trying to... Uh, uh, stamp upon the consciousness of all God's people um, and this mark is in the heart in the mind uh, of anyone anyone who finds justification for killing in the name of God even uh, if they do it legally uh, we, we are not allowed to partake in capital punishment because God put the mark on Cain and said if anybody slays Cain God will take vengeance on that person sevenfold so we as the children of light must not participate in the punishment, condemnation of anybody who kills. We're not allowed to do that. Only God is allowed to do that. And here we have now the warrior president of the United States who is also known as the, uh, that governor who signed the death warrant, uh, again, you know, allowed the execution in the name of Christ more than any other governor, you see, because he's a son of darkness, he's Mark, he's a, he's a man of death, he's not a, a man of life. And now God is drawing him into the fray to exact vengeance on him and, of course, upon the entire political system that he represents and rules over. So this, this consciousness appeared on the earth 6,000 years ago? 120 Jubilees ago, right. How do you know? Well, because uh, we... Uh, we just follow the structure that we are given in the scripture to follow. Uh, what we do is just simply obey the scriptures where it tells us to begin this counting. And through the agency of the prophets, we have been giving these numbers to calculate with. And as we begin to calculate with these numbers, it takes us back 120 jubilees. And even when we look in the secular books of the historians, we see that we are now in that time of the emerging of historic consciousness this we are now entering into the historical age the end of the age of atlantis where that civilization that existed in the west prior to the time of adam and adam was an atlantean and that age came to its conclusion in the wars of atlantis legends of which are preserved in the timaeus and all of the legends of atlantis that plato gleaned out of the teachings of Egypt, but we see them, we see those legends are everywhere in the, in the uh, oral traditions of indigenous American peoples. All throughout the earth we have the, uh, the echoes of the legends of those times reverberating in our consciousness. And that's why Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. It wasn't a geological event that overflowed the earth in those days. It was a flood of war. And that's why the book of Revelation says, And the waters which thou sawest are multitudes and nations and tongues and people. So as God brought the Atlantean age to its conclusion in those times, we now see that 
God has duplicated the events in the attempt of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, modern Atlanteans, to rule the world again. And that's why it says, as it was in those days, so shall it be in, the day, in our days. Well, who wrote the story in Genesis? Well, Genesis is a, is a compilation of, of many, many oral traditions that were passed down and uh, were gathered up in the time of, the, of Moses. And Moses, not necessarily being any one individual people at all, but rather a name, he who is drawn out of the sea, a collective name um, uh, which describes the wisdom that um, was accumulated at that time. Moses was not necessarily an individual. No. Was he an individual? Well, they definitely, they definitely were those who existed in that time, who's, um, who were the charismatic leaders of that time, who led the children of Israel out of Egypt, led the mind of Israel out of darkness. But whoever they were, they hid themselves under the composite name of Moses and Aaron, because these are as much principles of understanding as they are the names of individuals, just the same way that the name Jesus or Yahshua is not the name of an individual person. It's the name of a collection of ideas that make up the composite unfolding of this divine mystery of Christ. So it's all what um, in Hebrew, well, in academic parlance would be called, it's all pseudo-epigraphical. It's these mystics, these prophets, these seers, not wishing to, exa uh, to exalt themselves, hide their writings under the names of other epic biblical characters. And so uh, when you read in the traditions, you see that um, you go back to the time of Moses, you're back in the time of the 18th dynasty in Egypt, where Hotep the fourth, Akhenaten, is leading the great um, revolution in, in Egyptian thinking leading to monotheism and it's out of this surge of monotheistic thought that all of a sudden we trace the history of Israel but when you look into the um, the archaeological remains of that time you see that what is written in the history of the book of Exodus there's no evidence for it ever happening because the children of Israel at that time, in those times, were not an army. It was not an Islamic army marching out of Egypt into Palestine, literally destroying and slaying everything in its path. But the teachings of Israel were, were a school of thought. It was a school of epic, allegorical, and metaphorical thought that was not happening then, but that would happen over the course of human history. And that's why Moses legislates Passover. Passover is a seven-day festival that brings us to the end of the events, that we must all be keeping Passover. Egypt is a metaphor for the human body, the lower nature itself. So what we have in this Old Testament that began to be compiled at the time of the Exodus and the traditions, the oral traditions, the written traditions, were then began to be handed down to the mind of Israel until finally we come to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah where another compilation of these books begins to um, unfold and then we come of course to the time of Christ where another compilation of these books emerges. Right, it's a teaching that went out into the world from that time and everyone who begins to experience the transformation and begins to walk in the light of that teaching is a child of Israel. Were the Egyptians around more than 6,000 years ago? Well, some people think they were around 100,000 years ago. You know, that everybody has some sort of, um, of um, um, as they do in the Hindu faith and as they do in many of the um, um, traditions of uh, man, um, 
they begin to take the times of the scriptures and sort of explode them exponentially into vast epic periods of ancient, ancient history. So um, uh, some people say that Egyptian civilization existed, uh, existed um, thousands and thousands of years before the time of Adam. Others see evidence for it coming to fruition about the time that the pyramids were being built. And that was after Adam, because the idea of the structure of the pyramid itself is included in the structure of the ideas that God began to uh, impress upon the mind of Adam. And so as these ideas began to go out into the earth, they found meaning in Vedic consciousness, they found meaning in an Egyptian consciousness, and of course these ideas have spread themselves all throughout the earth. And uh, what our role is now is to take all the pieces and the parts and put them back into a composite form, and that's what the structure of the Tree of Life allows us to do. Well, Egyptian is a pro Egypt is a product of this proto-ideal um, that see it didn't come from Egypt Egypt is the product of it Egypt well the the ideas you see Egypt as a geographical place existed certainly prior to the revelation of Adam but Egypt as an idea did not exist until after the time of Adam so Egypt as a construct came into being as out of the tribal context of human society, a new revelation appeared. That revelation was universal in nature. It took into account the wisdom of all ancient peoples and began to reformulate itself in terms of archetypal symbols, structures, ideas, and interpretation of events. And Egypt, as we know it, classical Egypt, from which we say the children of Israel were delivered, um, was a result of those ideas, was a result of those ideas being built in stone, not only in the East, but we look in America because this is where it all originated. We see these same structures being built here in the Western Hemisphere as well because uh, they are all um, born. All of these structures and these ideas are born out of the original revelation. And so the adepts in this science were those who traveled all throughout the earth in those ancient times, bringing the meaning and the mystery of these um, ideas with them. Egypt, as we know, is the first great civilization, yes or no? Yes, it's the, well, you know, where the scripture says, um, I saw a beast come up out of the sea, and this beast had seven heads. Well, these seven heads are the seven world empires upon which God has built the foundation of these present unfolding realities. And the foundation upon which all of these empires were set is Egypt. But Egypt, the Egypt that the prophets speak of, is not necessarily confined to that little place of geography in the East. Egypt is a universal state of mind, <clears throat> the lowest state of mind, the foundation upon which God would begin to transform human consciousness. Egypt is the whole world, and every one of us are born into the Egypt of our own existence. Right, it's the lowest level of the pyramid. It's the lowest level of the pyramid. It's the foundation upon which these right. mysteries are right. set. And this came after the consciousness of Adam was introduced. Yes, yes. Okay. The name of Adam and Eve, where, what is, is there a numerical meaning in that? Is there... Well, of course, um, when the Messiah is revealed, uh, the Messiah who is fluent, the Messiahs, who will be fluent not only in the, um, in all of the insights, the numerical and hieroglyphic insights that come with 
and understanding of the Hebrew language. Um, insights that were gathered out of the ancient traditions and brought into the Hebrew state of mind. So they will m be able to articulate much more, much better than myself, uh, the meanings. But just on the surface, we take the name Adam. Adam uh, equals Aleph, Dalet, Mem, the number 46. And that's why we read in the, uh, in the scriptures that the temple of God was 46 years in building because the temple of God is man himself. So we begin to see that the name Adam has all of these. Um, did you get the point where we were talking about the, uh, the messiahs who will be able to articulate yes. these ideas yes. much more perfectly? Yeah, that's the number 46. Okay, so in the surface, uh, we um, see that the name Adam has a numerical value of 46. Uh, we um, begin to then uh, make the connection, the correlation to what the uh, prophets were saying in the scriptures that the temple of God was 40 and 6 years in building. 40, of course, being the time of the children of Israel's sojourn in the wilderness of the nations, and therefore out of all the nations is God creating the perfect Adam, out of all religious traditions, out of all races of humanity. <clears throat> and so the temple of God is, of course, through this understanding, perceived to be man himself, Adam. Now, you can take the, the, the numerical properties of the name Adam. You have Adam, David, Moshiach, Messiah. So in these three uh, uh, numerical properties of the name, what you see is you have Adam in the beginning, David in the middle, and that's where balance comes from. See, David appears 3,000 years after Adam and 3,000 years before us. And that's why it says that when the Messiah who comes, the name will be David or David, because David represents balance, harmony, upon which everything can be balanced. The past to the future, male to female, heaven to earth, and Va, the, the, the middle letter in the name David, of course, is the center of the tree of life, Tiferet, beauty. So we begin to take all of these names, and when we become uh, skilled in um, the study of the numerical and hieroglyphic value of these names, we begin to see how they all sit on top of each other, define one another, and um, provide structure and form to our thoughts. And once our thoughts are reconformed to the, to the mind of wisdom itself, to the mind of God, then we begin to be created in God's image. Why 40 and 6? Well, the letter Mem is equal numerically to the number 40. That's in Adam? In, in Adam. See, Adam rep uh, e adds up to the number 46. Adam, A D A M. One four one forty. Okay, so now you have the number forty six, and so then you take the time of the temple being built, which is also we are told forty six years. So you make the correlation, and you say God's temple is Adam. This is where God dwells in man. Then, of course, we know that man has a lower nature and a higher nature, and he must, because in order to be conformed to the mind of God, he must be totally conscious of his potential for evil. And it is in this unveiling of man's lower nature that the new Adam is formed. And as the new Adam is formed, we see it's formed in the principle of balance, which means that Adam is not a male person. Adam is both a male and a female in perfect balance with one with another. And if the first Adam was a male and a female, then 
the perfect Adam, which is the Messiah, are also a male and a female. What's the significance of Eve? Is there any? Yes, Eve is a uh, again a metaphorical construct. Uh, it is applied by the authors of the New Testament to represent those who were receiving the seed of understanding and becoming the first church. Paul says that. The, Eve is the church, and this is a great mystery in the book of Ephesians, fifth chapter. However, who is it that is the receptive principle of creation but the Divine Mother herself? And if the Divine Mother did not descend into what we perceive is the darkness of the feminine principle, then we would never know the difference between good and evil. So it is wisdom herself that has allowed us to eat from this, that dark side of the tree that we have commanded not to. But if we didn't, we could never be created in her image. And therefore, um, we would never know the difference between good and evil. So this is the effects of the creative mind of the father and the mother, one with each other. They put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden and said, do not eat from it. But we must eat from it because it's a metaphor of human experience itself. And without the experience, with our own darker impulses, our own darker side, we could never come these 6,000 years later to a state of divine consciousness. And once we have attained to it, however, and we see that the good and the evil come from the same source, from God, then I understand the meaning of my own nature in its relationship to God. I understand I have this dark impulse within me. And when I subdue this dark impulse within myself and I keep it captive, I become literally the true holy warrior, which God is. And when I am making war against the lower impulses of my own nature, God, who dwells in all reality, is making war against the darkness that pervades this age. And that's what God is doing. So we are warriors. God is a warrior. But a true holy warrior is one who has overcome the darkness of themselves and are now has come alive to a state of Christ or Buddha consciousness and can see God in the sum of all reality. And they don't go out to make war against God, but they make war against the darkness that is deceiving the people, making it uh, impossible for the people to perceive the nature of God. So now the new atoms are standing on the earth because we are now receiving the same revelation that God gave to the first atom. And that is, I am the sum of all reality. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Everything that's coming is coming from me. And I am bringing it in the interest of the light itself. I am bringing darkness to its conclusion. And so that's in essence what we are seeing unfolding. We are seeing all these archetypal realities unfolding in our time. And uh, it's because we've come to the fullness of the process of creation itself. And now we are being created in the image of the divine, uh, who is the sum of all natural and human events. There's nothing but God. God pervades the universe. She is not only the repos she is not only that, but she is a manifest manifestation of the Divine Mother herself. See, because as they revealed themselves to Adam, now Eve took up her place in all those who were listening to Adam. Because now she was going to begin the descent. The occultation? The, yes, the occultation of the light into the darkness. That's why the fall begins in the West. Because now the the mind of light will now descend into the necessary process of experience in order to see what darkness looks like. But what, what, why, why the female? Well, because before creation, God was united 
him and him, herself in one. They will, you know, you can see it in the symbol of the Tao, which is Ketha on the tree of life, the crown, supreme crown. Well, above the supreme crown, beyond our, beyond our comprehension, is Ein Sof. Ein Sof is the perfect unity of all creation, the nothing, nothingness, the pure nothingness that exists everywhere in the universe, beyond the universe, it, it, we can... Because it's beyond the, beyond the comprehension. physical... But in Ein Sof is all the potential, the negative and positive force that will emerge in the creative order. It is, it is creative. It is potential. It is sitting there as potential energy. And who knows how many billions of years or millions of billions of trillions of, we can't even, we don't even have words to explain that realm. Have no words to explain time on that dimension. There is no time. We can't put yes, it into Yes, exactly. Years. That's why it's Ein Sof, limitless, uh, un, uh, unexplainable. Yeah, well, that's how young uh, Ein Sof would now reveal themselves in the meaning of the emerging meaning of these divine names. So all of a sudden, that which is united with itself has decided to transform themselves into a matrix of sensual awareness out of which they can bring forth children, duplicates of themselves so that they're not alone. I mean, it's the only way we can explain it. There may be higher reasons for it all. But we look at them as divine parents. And we can look into the, into the life of our own parents to understand something of the mind of God. And they desired children. They wanted not to be alone. They wanted in their full age to enter into their rest and like us, sit on the back porch and have the kids come up and hang out. So the only way, the only way they could um, figure out how to do that is the way that they did it. And so she decided, all right, I'll go down and you stay here. And I'll go down into the universe and I will become the negative force. You stay above and you remain in the positive force. And he, metaphorically now, see he's not the father until she becomes the mother. Only then do they break in half. And now does the divine feminine principle descend into matter. And the divine masculine principle remains above in that incomparable comprehensible realm where the divine dwells. And he then metaphorically represents the higher mind of the universe itself. Now, how can we know anything about that unless something informed us about it? Because all we are is, is, is just matter. So she descends she becomes creation itself. She is a tree of life to them who lay hold upon her. And she descends into, she becomes the Big Bang. She becomes the expanding universe. She becomes the descent of divine consciousness. As she descends, she is always bringing the idea of the Father with her. Because she is coming down. She's coming down and all of a sudden, the sun the solar system in which we dwell all of a sudden begins to take shape and these planets begin to form. And this is God, the father and the mother just creating of themselves a universe in which they can descend and have babies, have children, bring forth life. And so finally, the planet Earth is formed. And who is it but our Divine Mother herself? She's forming herself. And throughout all the chemical interchanges of 
geological time, the son who is now metaphorically the father, because he's always above, is now involved in this divine state of sexual embrace with the earth. And the two of them, the interchange of the light and, and the elements of the earth, bing, bing, the first um, amino acids appear, the first sparks of life appear in the form of the DNA molecule. And the molecule is in the absolute image of the oracle, the tree of life. And through this process now of unfolding evolution, life is rooting in the, in, in, the, in the substance of the planet because the Divine Mother now is springing forth life. She is life. She is everything that we can behold, breathe, think of, drink. She's everything. And in the process of time, in their image, the first proto-human life appears on the planet. It makes no difference to me where this happened. We'll have a clearer understanding of this, whether it happened in Africa, whether it happened independently in all of the continents together. Either way, I praise God, it makes no difference where it happened. And But it is out of this proto-human form, whether it came from apes or whether it came just from itself, its own creative, followed its own um, evolutionary path, the first stirrings of divine intellect began. So again, all of human evolution begins as a relationship between the within and the without. And so all the rest is uh, scientific history. We begin to see from that point on that humans are now emerging out of the primal order of life with the very nature of God within. And because God is a God of war, that's how God has chosen to bring about human understanding that God is God can destroy what God has created. We must know that about our Father. You see, because if the Father decided not to reveal his true nature, then we would always have something missing in that essential part of our own psyche. Something that we couldn't talk to God about because he withheld something of his own nature. So God is revealing over the course of the last 6,000 years almost the entire contents of his own mind. Now we see it, and there's nothing about our own uh, psychological existence that we cannot take to God. Because God is showing, hey, look, this, is, this is where I'm at. There's nothing abnormal. Nothing abnormal, nothing abnormal. Whatever problem we have, we take it to each other for sure but we can also sit down at the table of our parents and say, you know, I know I can't hide this from you. You've been uh, watching me grow up uh, for 20 years. You know exactly the things I've been going through. And as a, and, and as a wise parent, the parent sits there and says, no, don't, don't be afraid. You're... We never even are, you know. Well, Schrodinger's wave functions all collapsing and uh, reappearing in different uh, places, different dimensions. Yeah, God could have chosen an infinite uh, an, uh, uh, amount of ways to create the universe or manifest themselves. But um, uh, they are like the universal Buddhas. They sat together uh, underneath their own tree of enlightenment and uh, said, yes, but if I do this, then this will be the effect. If I do it this way, I will upset this balance. If I'm too harsh, then I will not create in our creation that which I want to be understood. Yes. And so they chose the most economical path to bring about 
this state of human consciousness. That's why there, there is all of this great destruction, but not too much. There is um, great tolerance. These are the two sides of the tree of life, tolerance and justice. So there is great love being born in our time. But if the world was just absolutely tolerant, then darkness would have its way. And we would never, never be able to come to equilibrium. So there is tolerance, but at the same time, God says, yes, but not that much that I will not end. Adam is created, and why is Eve created out of a rib? What is the meaning of that? Well, of course, it's not a literal description right, of reality. Literal, what's, the, what's the esoteric? Well, uh, the classical explanation of those who are always seeking equilibrium in all things, and particularly many of the uh, uh, learned rabbis and the imams and teachers of the past, is that the reason God metaphorically created Eve out of the rib is according to these teachings that if God created Eve out of the, the mind of Adam, then she would always be superior to Adam and she would always be able to push Adam below her. And if she was created from anything lower than that part of Adam, than the rib, then Adam would always be exercising his superiority over her and that there would never be equilibrium because he would believe that it is divinely ordained that he, she should be subject to him. And so therefore, God, in their wisdom, created the metaphor where they were taken out of each other's side so that they would always be seeking equilibrium and balance between themselves. And, and so why does the serpent tempt Eve? Well, because she, you see, the Divine Mother is she who has descended into and enlightens the lower consciousness. That's why the female is always accused of being the temptress, the, the dark one. Because indeed, the Divine Mother is the one who is dwelling in the dark side of matter, always illuminating the consciousness of human beings. She is wisdom herself. She is Sophia. So she has chosen to descend with her children into uh, a state of exile, away from the light. And so it is she who, um, understanding the meaning of the serpent's purpose in the earth, the serpent is actually a guide. The serpent, you see, in, 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 the, in the symbol of the caduceus, we have, we have two streams of thought. You have a negative stream moving downwards and a positive stream moving upwards and they're intertwined with each other. And so one is descent, the other is ascent. And then they culminate in the form of the caduceus of a serpent of wisdom, of divine wisdom, of healing. And so the symbol of the serpent drawing the mind of Eve down is the symbol of the divine mother herself saying, yes, O mind of Adam, come down, come down, come down, descend into a state of self-realization. Because if you do not learn who you are, you will remain always um, a stranger from the div divine light. So the serpent draws the mind spiraling down into a state of, of collective and individual self-consciousness, self-awareness, self-realization. Oh. Well, just by the gravitational effects of our own existence, you know, kind of, we, we live in a body that has a gravitational uh, field that's attracted to the earth, and, um, and it's this gravitational field that keeps us always constantly aware of ourself. We're always aware of our own physical necessities, our own um, uh, primal drives, uh, sexuality, um, hunger, thirst. And so when we don't bring these drives under control, and that's what self-realization allows us to do, then these drives become the predominant force that rules over us. 
and um, we see that's what's happened. That's why we've come to the end of Kali Yuga. The, the, the predominant primal drives of man are ruling the planet. And, uh, but it, again, this is all the, uh, the plan of God so that we could see what that looks like. So that we could know what a world serving the serpent, the serpentine nature, um, appears like when it comes to its perfection. But the serpent who also drew us down will also reveal itself and that's what it's doing in the form of Leviathan. Once you see it, now you see the serpent is saying, okay, now follow me. And the serpent is our guide then to Christ consciousness. And that's why Moses illustrates the mystery of Christ to the children of Israel when they were being bitten by the serpents in the wilderness as a form of a serpent on a cross. And that's why he said, you know, that's why the serpent who is Christ is elevated above us. And it says that whoever will look up, in other words, whoever will cast their gaze from the lower earth to the higher heavens will be uh, transformed. So the serpent's job is to bring us down, and it's also the serpent in the form of the Christ mystery, which brings us back up again to a state of... Moses put a serpent on a cross? Yeah. I don't know. Can you elaborate on that? Well, in the book of... Uh, um, in the Torah, the book of Numbers, um, we're told that the children of Israel were being wasted in the wilderness, bitten by serpents. They were uh, uh, in bondage to their own fears, doubts, uh, their own lower inclinations that were creating chaos and disorder uh, in the mind of, of the people. And uh, when they were under such dire straits, Moses lifted up this pole in the wilderness, which is a, 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 an ancient form of the caduceus, which is also a symbol of Christ on the Christ. Uh, that's why Paul later on, that uh, Jew of all Jews, will begin to see and understand the symbolism of the Torah. And he says, I seek now to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. As soon as you crucify, as soon as you look up at this mystery and begin to crucify your old fallen nature, you'll be able to understand what I understand and you'll be able to read my writings because it's all hidden there. But until you do that first, you will never understand what it is I'm trying to get across here. So first die, and then when you come alive, then you'll see the meaning here. Why, why do we often use the term, especially in the more dogmatic teachings of falling? Well, because the universe is- Especially in, in Genesis. Everything's falling. Falling of man. Yeah, well, everything is falling. The universe is falling. That's how the, gravi that's how the, the gravitational field operates. Uh, you have this force operating from the center of the universe, keeping everything. I see, if there were, everything is falling. Everything is dropping. The planets are dropping. The stars are dropping. Everything is dropping because the metaphor of creation is the metaphor of fall. God descended from their own pure state into matter. The very first... Um, the very first um, uh, elements that were created were the very lightest elements of all. Electrons, neutrons, which all of a sudden formed themselves into the lightest element, hydrogen and helium. And so it's in this descent from lightest elements to heavy elements do we follow the mind of creation until finally as a result of uh, the transformation that takes place through these great, immense cosmic epics of gravitational collapses and explosions when heavier elements are being formed, you see what God is doing is clothing themselves, not only in the forces and in the dimensions of reality itself, but they are clothing their absolute spiritual uh, existence in the uh, illusion of matter and they are now creating heavier elements and heavier elements and heavier elements until finally they the Sun 
with the earth, which is made up of all these heavier elements, well, here they are. You see, they're hidden in the elements of these atomic structures themselves. So the very first metaphor is fall, descent from lightness to heaviness, from spiritual reality into gross matter. And so now, because they are descending to create us, they have created a, um, a um, set of gates, series of gates that exist between the highest spiritual world and the world of gross matter. And the only way that we can learn to get through those gates is if we fall as well. Because we must, in order to come to God realization, descend to ourselves. So that's what this last 6,000 years has been. It's been a descent of man into the very lowest state of his own material world and into the lowest state of it. See, that's by, by descending into the, uh, an understanding of material world have we uh, found our way through the illusions into the, uh, into the higher worlds. It couldn't happen until we made the full descent. And in this full descent, we are coming to self-realization. So it's all a matter. Of, it's all about falling, falling, falling. And in the fall, in the darkness, Scripture says, "Even though I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there," because you see, God is waiting at the darkness. Christ, the Spirit of Christ consciousness, who, not alone with Himself, it's not Jesus we find there, but it's Jesus and Mary Magdalene because Christ is both of these. She's there too. She's the most perfect person in the scripture. She, the divine whore, the divine prostitute, is a symbol of human consciousness which does descend into the darkest uh, uh, dimensions of its own existence to discover life itself. And so Mary Magdalene is that most uh, foremost of Gnostic figures who uh, has all seven devils gone out of her, which means that she has descended to the depth of her own nature, and all of the seven figurative states of mental and spiritual complexity are all purged. She is a perfect Christ-conscious person, and the only way she could attain to it was through descent. Because when she got into her bed of hell, who did she find coming to the brothel? Well, there he was, Jesus. Jesus was down there looking for himself too. And he found Mary. Mary found him. And that's what it says in the psalm, because fundamentalist Christians think that's very, that's a heresy to talk about sexuality as being the most, um, uh, the divine pathway. The tantric path is the pathway to self-realization. And um, so these symbols of the tantric path are hidden everywhere in Christianity. And um, it's in this descent. Uh, and the lowest chakra, of course, is the genitals, the lower nature itself. So you have to descend into yourself to illuminate all of these centers of, of human consciousness. And the lowest, of course, leads right down to the divine sexual principle. And that is here that the illumination takes place, metaphorically, in the West, because the West is the lowest um, ge geographical place of this descent. And so it's here that we have this most sublime relationship with the freedom to discover. Here we can do it. And it is here that we are purifying, raising the sparks. Because once the soul begins to illuminate and open up all of the dimensions of its own nature to the light of divine reality, the mind is purified, the flesh is purified, and that person and those persons can walk. doesn't make a difference where they walk. And they, they you know, you see... I mean, you could see people walking around naked. You see, in Islam, if they see a woman hardly uncovered, 
well, they begin to charge this person with lewdness and impropriety because they are, they are defaming or they are corrupting the soul of the Muslim man. Well, the response to that is complete the Hajj. Complete your Hajj, complete your pilgrimage. When you complete your pilgrimage to self-realization, you will have transcended the very nature of lust itself. You will be able to look at anyone in, in well, we went to the rainbow gathering a couple of years ago. And I brought my grandchildren there, and what did they see? But people totally unclothed and naked, but they saw it in the context of pure intention. And so now I, I see that they don't titillate over dirty jokes anymore because they've seen it. Their, their eyes are open to it. They understand, well, you know, the, uh, the, the kids in school tell dirty jokes about uh, anatomies and parts and... I can see my grandkids go, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's not hilariously funny anymore because they've already seen those things. And that's once you see it, once you see it and experience and taste it and touch it, uh, it becomes part of the natural order. And that it becomes that part of the natural order that you want to purify as you purify yourself. And that's why it says in the scriptures, and they were naked and they were not ashamed. What it means is when those who are coming to a perfect mind come together, they will understand the path that everyone took to get to that place. And they will not be ashamed of the, the, the pathway each of us took. It doesn't make a difference which way you came. I think it's rather revealing another of the infinite number of signs that we see all over the place of God creating him and herself in, in their image in that gravity compels us one to the other and gravity keeps man bound to the earth or to the serpent nature is that correct mm -hmm. yeah it, yeah and so when you said earlier that the divine mother you know removes herself from the father in their union before Catherine she becomes gross matter. He remains the mind of the universe. Does that mean that even us as men and women, everything that is matter is essentially the garments of this divine female principle? It's, it, it uh, yes, in essence, we are all, you see, every, even every child that is conceived in its mother's womb is feminine for seven days. It's not until the seventh day that the hormonal switch happens. And if we're going to be male, then the hormone switches in the seventh day, but everything is essentially feminine. The universe is feminine. The, the male, the, the, the world is feminine. And um, the male is formed out of the feminine principle. Everything is born out of the feminine principle. So um, it is in... But again, it's all metaphor. You see, we're not to attribute to the male any particular merit just because his gender was used as the um, as a description of that which has been coming out of the darkness and attaining to Christ consciousness. Because it is all pure metaphor. It has nothing to do with physical reality. The metaphors take place in the life of every individual, whether they are male and female. And that's why, you know, um, if it wasn't for the feminine principle, this mystery wouldn't even be unfolding because she is the repository of the secrets of this system. That's why the Grail Knights those who were questing for the meaning of the mystery of Christ could not even approach this meaning until they were subservient, well, not subservient in that sense, but until God saw that they were serving the divine feminine principle. And in their serving the mysteries of the feminine principle, she is empowered. And so you see this little circle in the symbol that we um, we uh, uh, were looking at, the picture that we were looking at where the knight errant is bowing before her. 
in his um, service to her, she is empowered to anoint him. But until this little circle is complete, then everything, the circle is not complete, balance does not happen. And she, because when the male principle came to power 2,000 years ago, she, when she went into occultation and into hiding with her mysteries, she took the grail with her, and in her possession is Excalibur, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so when we come to the end of the age where we are, and the fellowship of the knights of the round table is beginning to formulate itself. That's why Paul said that you may um, have access to the fellowship of the mystery. When those who come to the end of the age to come to drink the cup that Christ instituted, according to the, the legend and myth, in the, at the Last Supper in the first century, uh, they will then drink down this cup. They will offer the evening sacrifice. They will complete the mystery of Christ. But in order to do so, they must be empowered with the sword of the Spirit. They must be empowered with the meaning of the Word of God. And, of course, it's the Divine Lady who has that sword. And that's the whole mystery of Merlin and... Um, the Merlins, and if you look in Central Europe, the center of this mystery is right there in the, in, in, in the head of the dragon itself. And that's why King Arthur's father is Utapendragon, because it's out of this center of Europe is the center of this mystery. And those mysteries now find their way to Ireland and Britain in the time of Christ with the mysteries of the Grail and the mysteries of the knights of the round table and now we have come to where the circle is complete and you will see the manifestation of this fellowship and what are they doing they are serving the reappearance of the feminine principle which is blowing the trumpet in the new moon so um, one of the questions of course anyone who found this way into the grail uh, castle and the only ones who can find their way in and those who's not looking for it in the first place. If you're looking for it, it stays forever uh, hidden. But those who didn't even know they were looking for it, all of a sudden wind up there. But if we wind up there in the Grail Castle and we're not wise enough to ask the proper questions, uh, there's nothing but tears and disappointment because uh, the land stays decimated and uh, the, nothing is healed. And the question, of course, is, what is the grail and whom does it serve? And when we ask those two pertinent questions, then we get the answer and the grail, access to the grail itself. Now, if we were to move back toward the historical vein that we were speaking in a little while ago, I know having read chapter two, or actually, I have questions pertaining to chapter two of the, of the website of the book. In, and I've heard you allude to it before, how the original Garden of Eden is here in America. I've heard you speak of how the story of Atlantis is really a metaphor for all of this enormous trade and the languages of the earth and just a flooding of... Uh, well, before there was a flooding of war, there was just this... I don't know what it was, but not, not really technological, like, you know, some people interpret it to mm -hmm. be like spaceships flying around and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but just traveling across the oceans and, and trading and all, you know, like, this was before Adam, yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and, and so then these cultures destroyed one another? They went to war. Is this historical or is this yeah. really just... Yeah, it, no, it's historical. Uh, How come there's no records of it? Oh, you? there are. There are, there are in the, uh, in the um, books of Plato, and Plato learned it from the Egyptian priests of Sais, who were preserving this legend of a great power that advanced upon Europe from the Atlantic Ocean. And it's this great power pushed its way as far as Egypt and into Central Europe as far as Greece, and they were trying to dominate the world. And it says in that one day and night, 
this empire. And then uh, Plato just passes along the description of this empire. And you see, really, what he's talking about is a description of the structural um, description of the center of the tree of life. He's talking, he's giving it in, in um, archetypal description of the structure of this empire and how it was created and formed. Well, he's just using the dimensions of the universal oracle as a description of the, this reality. And then the priest said um, that this empire was checked by the forces of the, the East. And, uh, and as it was checked, a, a war ensued and the Atlanteans lost the war. Or at least the wars ended. Well, um, we find this whole reality also preserved in the Rig Veda where we find that the earliest uh, proponents of Vedic knowledge uh, report about the great war that Indra fought against the dragon, Ritra. Well, this is the wars of light and darkness. Those who were pacifists in that ancient time, how they fought their way through spiritually against the forces of darkness that were inundating the world. And they escaped out of those wars by destroying their own propensity for war itself. And they wind up in India as the, um, uh, as the first authors of Vedic uh, knowledge. But the Vedas come from Adam. The Vedas come from Adam. So in order to come from the Garden of Eden in the West, they had to come through all of the events of the Atlantean Wars across Europe and then down into India, where they could now begin to record the traditions that they had accumulated coming across. Where was Atlantis? Uh, right where it is now, uh, North America. All of the Atlantic, uh, the, the, the transatlantic powers that lived all over the Atlantic coast of Europe and, uh, and uh, North America. It was How do you know this? Well, we know it just by piecing together the the pieces of the tradition and then we know you see uh, we believe that the divine mother has always been revealing the elements of her mystery to various schools of thought and individuals throughout the course of history so we must trust the traditions that have been passed down to us or else we're we're sort of naked we, we don't have anything to base our, our perceptions on. So um, there have been many historians and uh, uh, people who have tried to um, um, make sense of the legends of Atlantis. And when we begin to open up their writings, some will say, no, you can't put it together this way. But when you find that enough of these scholars and enough of these individuals are beginning to create a picture, then you can trust the picture that is forming. Because divine wisdom has always been present in the universe, and we just begin to trust the picture that is forming and then uh, begin to um, use this picture as a basis for our understanding. Uh, our own times. So you're saying, what, 10,000, 20,000 years ago, man populated this planet and, and traveled all over the planet? Um, that's what some people are saying, yes. What do you, that, what do you think? Well, I think, um, of course, human beings are, are as old as the rocks, you know, the, the first fossils we see, that's, that wow. tells us how old the, the human species wow. is. And the human species Maybe is that they can prove it back to like eight million years, yeah, four million years. Yeah, exactly. It's as old as the first fossils. Yeah. And, um, and well, so. Well, we have fossils that are 160 or 250 million years old, like dinosaurs. dinosaurs. No, I mean, as, as old as the first human fossils, wow, okay. uh, the first proto human right, fossils. Right. Um, um, it is out of that time that we begin to trace the path, the history, the, uh, the uh, dimensions of human history. Uh, and then all of a sudden, if we in these studies begin to find that man shows up here 
or at least the effects of his presence are here, the effects of his presence are there and there and here and there, then we begin to see that man was on the move. Human consciousness was on the move. And if all of a sudden we find that 20, uh, 30, or 40, or 50, or 60,000 years ago, human beings were already in the North American continent, and all of a sudden we begin to devise theories about how they got here. Um, and among those theories include the very probability of transatlantic travel, uh, coming across the ocean in small vessels, just as Brendan the Navigator did in a little leather cork. Um, so we begin to say, okay, yes, men were traveling, human beings were traveling across the face right, of the earth. We're talking well before the Viking age. Oh, well, we're talking about uh, even before the Adamic time. Right. And um, if we accept... Uh, before there was God's law. Before there was, exactly, before there came a Torah in, or a Veda into the world, um, there was this um, transoceanic travel. And, um, well, one of the, the books that are most recent on the subject is The Discovery of America, 7000 BC, um, which uh, tells about the earliest of that culture that we will later associate with Phoenician culture, already traveling across to the Americas, back and forth, trading and metals and all other things. And we do see that that is true um, from the 26th to the 29th chapters of Ezekiel, where it talks about these ancient Phoenicians traveling across the oceans. Pre-Adamic? Uh, Pre-Adamic and then Adamic, yeah. Phoenicians, where yeah. are the Phoenicians from? Well, the, most people um, uh, argue about where they are from, but the scripture says clearly that they were Atlantean that the modern England is ancient Tyrus, and it was out of Tyrus that these ancient Phoenicians had their base from which they made uh, ports of call of all of these other places in the Atlantic, uh, along the Atlantean Rim. So is Atlantis the present Isle of Britain, or is it North America? It was all over the whole Atlantean side, but it was, yeah, the, the powers um, of those times were, um, and of course historians will put a better picture together, uh, concentrated in Britain, concentrated in North America, concentrated, um, and again, uh, we're not talking about a, a power that is equal in might to the United States of America. What we're talking about is tribal power that was concentrated in, um, in, a, in an army of maybe 10 or 20,000 warriors uh, that will give meaning to this myth of Atlantean might that will in turn, of course, emerge in the realities of our own time. So, um, so what was happening in a very, uh, very small way was enough to give rise to the myth. And the myth, of course, then had a life of its own, and it took off in the thinking of um, history. Um, and so how do you correlate the true Garden of Eden being, not solely in its descriptive term, based upon the river systems coming into and out of it, and how that gentleman in Florida... L.B. Calloway. Right, wrote, yeah. wrote of, but how... How do, else do you attribute it to being here in North America? And then, because other than that, outside of that theorem, and you know, not life itself began in the East, but civilization itself has supposedly began in the East, correct? Well, and then moved westward through the Middle East, through Europe, across the seas here in North America. But you're saying that it's now returning here to North America. It's returned here. Yeah. See, the scripture says that God took the man he created and put him in the garden. So I'm not saying that Adam was created. The first, Adam's first revelation happened here in North America. What I'm saying is that God created the mind of Adam and gave him a desire to understand um, the meaning of, uh, he gave him the desire to begin the process of historical consciousness. 
and that this man, this male and the female, I, I suggest, took their trip across to America, just as the colonists came across to America.